I want to bring in now Evan Vucci. He is an Associated Press, the Associated Press senior photographer, and he is the person who shot this iconic image. Let's put it up on the screen uh, there. He was that far away from former President Trump uh, last night, and this has quickly become the defining image, likely of this entire presidential campaign, and one that will immediately enter the history books as one of a moment that we all experienced together. Evan, uh, I'm very grateful to have you. Uh, the next three minutes are yours. Tell us uh, what it was like to be there, uh, making that image, what, what went through your mind, uh, and what this event says to all of us. Sure, hey Casey, how are you? Um, yeah, it was, you know, I've done this hundreds of times. It was a normal rally. Uh, I was set up in the buffer, which is the area right in front of where the president speaks. And everything was completely normal. Then over my left shoulder, I heard, I heard, you know, pops. And I, I knew immediately what it was. And then I just kind of went into uh, work mode. And um, the Secret Service rushed the stage. And I jumped up and I, I got there as quickly as I could. And I'm photographing them uh, covering uh, President Trump. And then I was thinking in my head, okay, well, what are they going to do next? How are they going to get him off the stage? Where is he going to go? How is this going to unfold? So you're trying to make all those decisions in the moment. And uh, so I ran to the other side of the stage thinking that that would be their evacuation route. And uh, as the president was standing up, he uh, started pumping his fist. And uh, I saw the blood on the side of his face. And, I, and uh, you know, you know that that was kind of the moment of uh, what was, you know, what was happening. It was. Evan, can you give us a sense? We've all seen the video now a number of times. Was he standing by the podium here? Is this where he's coming down off the stairs? And talk a little bit, too, about uh, your past experience that gives you uh, the ability to operate like this. And what's, you know, we shouldn't be operating at a combat zone uh, in a, at, a, at, a, at a rally, but this is what happened. Yeah, no, I mean, I have experience. I, I, I covered Iraq and Afghanistan. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've been in these situations before. Um, so, you know, the, the, that experience does help trying to stay calm and understand, like, you have a job to do. And as a still photographer, I don't get a second chance. So I knew, I knew that you have to just kind of keep your head and just do everything you can to document everything that's happening. And, and I get all the photos, all the angles, make sure your composition's right, your light is right. Um, you know, I mean, you kind of just go into uh, work mode, man. And it's, uh, you yeah, know, that, that, that's what it was. And, but, yeah, so where they were taking him off, it's just on the side of the podium. So uh, the Secret Service jumped on top of him right behind the lectern. And then as soon as they stand, stood him up, I knew that they were going to take him off that, off the side of the stairs and into the SUV waiting for him. So I just waited to see, um, you know, what I could get. So, Evan, um, we just have a few uh, seconds left in the show. I want to say sure. thank you very much. Uh, for joining us uh, this morning. Let's put Evan's image back up on the screen uh, if we can. Um, again, Evan was telling us uh, how he went. Uh, this is another one of his uh, pictures, but um, that one there uh, is the one that has immediately become uh, the iconic and defining image uh, of this moment in our history and in this uh, presidential campaign. Now, I want to bring in presidential historian Douglas Brinkley, who is here to join us this morning. Doug, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, put this in perspective for us, this is the first assassination attempt of a president since Ronald Reagan in 1981. So what was the national reaction to that at that time, and what was the impact on Reagan? Well, what happened in 1981, Reagan was a polarizing figure. He was seen as a, uh, an ultra-conservative by Democrats. Uh, he was shot only a couple weeks into his presidency in March of 1981. And from that point on, uh, once he got rushed to the George Washington the whole country started pulling for him. There was actually a sea change. You could feel that people that were Reagan skeptics were now praying for his recovery. And I edited Ronald Reagan's diaries, and the most profound passage was when Reagan wakes up after being shot and looked at the top of the ceiling of his hospital, and then suddenly, um, the first time he wrote, said, I, I thought I was a goner thought I was dead. The rest of my life is going to be dedicated to peace, by which he goes on to elaborate means ridding the world of nuclear weapons. So, so Doug, can you speak it was to... A religious, yeah, it was a religious epiphany for Reagan, having mm. that have been shot. Mm. And I wonder, President Trump, what he would feel like after the adrenaline goes away and you realize that you are in that kind of harm's way. Mm. 
And, and Doug, can you speak to how this image of martyrdom is received by the public when something like this happens? Well, that, that's exactly the right word. Um, there, you know, the fact is that photograph of uh, Trump. There are going to be a number of them, but with blood on on his face, and he looks like he's still in the fight. And then going and giving the fist up to the crowd. Then it's going to be a. Um, it's a, a very, very, um, you know, powerful moment. He becomes like a folklore figure, uh, Theodore Roosevelt type. Um, which is a different area. I mean, if you were going to write a biography of Donald Trump, this event is a central moment because um, Trump wasn't in Vietnam. He does, he isn't somebody that we've known for military decorations uh, being honored in that way. But here in the in the fight of a campaign, being able to take a, a bullet um, as he did and then get up and and still show vigor and uh, the, the march will go on is something that plays into the psyche of the American people in a very positive way. Hmm. All right, I'm going to bring this into the room here. Uh, so uh, just to pick up on that, talk about the image of Donald Trump. This is what our colleague uh, Stephen Collinson writes. He says, these images will stand in history and enrich Trump's mythology just as surely as the picture of his mugshot in an Atlanta jail and the footage of his return to the White House in 2020 after beating a serious COVID-19 Infection. I mean, it was no question, no surprise, I suppose, why the Trump campaign was quick to point out some of these images of him yesterday, you know, pumping his fist, the American flag on the back, and blood on his face. They believe it looks great for him. I think what I found to be most remarkable from a, from a purely kind of political slash imagery sense is in the moment, the former president stopped the Secret Service agent, stopped his detail around him. You can hear him say, wait, wait, wait. And what he's doing is he's popping up to be able to pump his fist so people can see him when you can see him mouth fight, 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 um, and does it several more times on the way down. He was aware of that in that moment, which, you know, I, I don't know what it takes in a moment where you just got shot in the ear, <laughs> that that kind of comes to your mind. And perhaps it's just kind of who Trump is on some level. Um, the imagery is you cannot avoid it. It's extraordinarily powerful whether you love the guy or hate the guy in that moment. And I think more than anything else last night, Republicans certainly were, were focused on it. I think that's why I keep saying you're going to see it on almost a loop during the rally itself. But I think even Democrats as well were acknowledging that, like, in that moment, for what had just occurred, uh, those pictures are incredibly powerful, and they are going to be in history books for decades to come. There's just no question about it. Uh, I want to ask you, Kayla, about the president last night. He, how he processed the news. You've been doing some reporting about this. Talk to us about his decision to... Uh, about to come out and speak last night and what he's planning to do in the days ahead. Well, this is a critical stretch of time for President Biden's own candidacy. And yesterday he was with his family in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, where they have a home. And he was at church when this event un uh, took place. And he was briefed shortly after that. He decided to, to speak to the nation. And he also spoke by phone with former President Trump, who he has established publicly as a persona non grata in American politics. So the fact that these two uh, these two politicians, who have no love lost between each other, uh, got on the phone and held a conversation in that moment, I think is as striking as anything um, that we saw took place. The question now is how Biden processes this in the coming day. Does he change his travel schedule? How does he choose to mes message this? There are a few practical considerations for him. Number one, and we've been talking about his health and his stamina. His team fiercely protects his downtime, and he was supposed to have two days essentially off the grid in between a fairly grueling stretch of campaigning. How does the president appear, President Biden, when he is on the trail this week? Number two, there are going to be questions about how his Department of Homeland Security processed requests for Secret Service detail that President Trump had. That's already circulating on social media. And then finally, he's been talking about an assault weapons ban. Does he use this as a moment to back a policy that he has been very vocal about the country needing? Does he find an audience in uh, Trump's otherwise, you know, the those who lean toward Trump, uh, does he find a receptive audience to that message, or does he choose to um, not pursue this as a policy path in this moment? Those are all decisions that he has to make in yeah, the really, next few days. Really interesting. Thank you for a great discussion, guys. Thank you to Doug Brinkley as well for joining me this morning.